Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I do cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Let us worship God. The Lord preserves our lives. God abounds in forgiveness and steadfast love. Therefore, we are free to come without fear to the throne of grace and honestly repent of our sin. Come, all who want to confess, repent, and be made whole. Come and call on the Lord who promises to hear our cries. Take a moment to confess your sins before God. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Friends, believe the good news. Through Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, everyone. When you tune in to our worship service Sunday, it will be Father's Day. So our wish to all of our dads and fathers is that you'll have a very special day. And hopefully, if possible, you either were served breakfast in bed or you served the mother of your children breakfast in bed, which would be quite a twist. But anyway, happy Father's Day, and we hope you have a wonderful, fantastic day celebrating your children and your family. Years ago, I took up photography, 
just kind of as a sideline hobby and basically have had fun with it for years and years and of course started out with a 35 millimeter camera and for in today's technology have moved to the digital camera. And in taking or making a picture, and I choose that word very carefully, because a photographer makes a picture. The camera's got to be ready. It's got to be ready at all times. And when you're taking or making a picture, everything has to be precise. You've got the shutter speed, which controls the, the length of time that the light is exposed to, or today, to the card. Then you have the aperture setting, which controls the amount of light that is exposed to the card. Then you have your dimensions and your balance, your backlight. All of that comes into play. Everything has to be set just right to make that picture. But if there's one thing that controls the entire settings, it's the focus. When, when we're out of focus, We have this. When we're in focus, we have this. Are you in focus, Bob? Pretty much in focus. Today, what are you focused on? Where is our focus? I think that it would be safe to say that we are overwhelmed with COVID-19, the media, demonstrations, violence, politics. It appears that our country is divided, and I can go on and on and on. Definitely COVID-19 and everything that surrounds COVID-19 in today's circumstances kind of has altered our focus. So I want to remind you of something. Just like the camera, if we're not focused, things will be blurred. All things will be blurred. So it's important for us to be focused and to sometimes refocus. Well, as children of God and brothers and sisters of Christ, we have the gracious gift of focusing or refocusing on the reality of God's presence. And he is here, definitely here and among us. God told Jeremiah in chapter 17, Jeremiah 17, 7, which is easy to remember. He said, tell my children this, blessed, happy, and I'll add focused are those whose hope is the Lord, whose confidence is him. They are like a tree planted by the waters who sends its roots down to the stream. In times of drought and heat, its leaves will not wither. The leaves will always be green. And in times of, of drought and heat, it will always bear fruit. That, my friends, is a focus and a refocus. The reality of God's presence is here with us today. It always has been. It always will be. Jesus was questioned by the Pharisees, so where is this kingdom of God? His answer to them, it is in your midst or within you. So I pray that our focus and refocus will be on Christ, the grace of God, and the reality of his presence. Because when we focus, we can certainly be assured of one thing. He is with us now and forevermore. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love and the assurance and reassurance of the reality of your presence, that you're still working in this world to bring about your purpose. Now may we as your children 
be a part of that purpose and share that message with others. In your name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson comes from the second chapter of Genesis today, verses 8 through 13. Listen now for the word of God. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of this boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. These were the words that Julie Andrews sang in The Sound of Music, one of my all-time favorite movies. It was a sweet song, a song about love, a song about happy things in life. It's a nice thought, 
that somewhere we must have done something good to receive the blessings of today. But this thinking goes totally against the theology of who we are as children of God and the theology of grace. In the Old Testament, Job's friends asked Job for what evil in his life was he being repaid when in fact in the fifth chapter of Matthew, Jesus says, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We're not necessarily punished for the evil that we do, nor are we blessed for the good that we do. Tracking the lives of Abraham and Sarah in that 21st chapter of Genesis is proof of God's blessing in spite of the paths we take. Abraham did his share of foolish things, not always obeying God, like trying to pass his wife off as his sister to the king of Egypt to save his own skin. Silly things, really. The really big thing, though, that Abraham and Sarah did is something that they both would have preferred was left out of Scripture for generations to read about. And that is the story of how Abraham's son Ishmael came about. If you recall, God promised to make Abraham the father of many, many nations. Quite a blessing, I'd say. One that must have really pumped Abraham up thinking about all these sons God had promised him. But there was one little problem. Sarah and Abraham were both up in years and they became a little impatient. So like we do sometimes, they looked for their own solution and their eyes landed on Sarah's servant, Hagar. Hagar was younger, Sarah thought, and if Abraham and Hagar got together, well then, Abraham might have a son. And so Abraham and Hagar got together. Ishmael was born and the troubles began. So much so that Hagar and Ishmael were banished to the wilderness to fend for themselves. Ah, oh, the best laid plans. Sarah and Abraham running ahead of God's promise and fixing things, so they thought, themselves. And the end result, Sarah's extreme jealousy towards Hagar, Abraham losing the opportunity to be with his firstborn son, and Hagar and her child wandering in the wilderness alone. But thankfully, this is not the end of the story. Abraham and Sarah eventually had their son Isaac, just as God had promised. And for Hagar and Ishmael, even when the provisions in the wilderness ran out, God provided. And as it turns out, Abraham is among those listed in that great cloud of witnesses in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he'd been promised as in a foreign land, living in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. And by faith, he received the power of procreation, even though he was too old and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered God faithful who had promised. By faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac, he who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son. By faith, Isaac invoked blessings for the future on Jacob and Esau. It is interesting, don't you think, that the writer of Hebrews doesn't mention the mistakes of Abraham and Sarah. It is interesting, don't you think, that rather than listing their sin and their failures, that it's their faith that the writer found significant. In these months of quarantine, with most of us spending more time at home, we have a lot of downtime. I've actually enjoyed the extra time to do some reading, a little needlepoint. I've cooked and baked, and for the first time in years, have especially enjoyed the bounty of fresh strawberries and blueberries and garden vegetables. My mind is clearer, less cluttered with plans to-do list running here and there. And really, I think that might be a good thing for us, maybe a small mixed blessing mixed in with the concerns of COVID-19. 
There have been a few occasions when I've caught myself reviewing times in my life when I did not quite measure up. We all have those in our lives, and if we're not careful, those negative things can take over our thoughts and strip us of the joy for which we all strive. Perhaps during the season of pause, when we have more time on our hands, it will be helpful to review who we are as the children of God. We need to be reminded that those times of weakness have been dealt with once and for all under the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in his letter to the church at Rome, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we are no longer enslaved to sin. And in the sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul says this in his letter to the church at Corinth. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. At the moment we profess our faith in Jesus Christ, our old self is crucified with Christ so that we no longer live to be slaves to sin. We should not be held captive by our failures and sins of the past. Morning by morning, we see new mercies of a new day and a fresh beginning. All that has occurred in the past should stay there in the past. With each prayer of confession and with each gift of pardon, we are reminded by Paul and Romans, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. No person failed more in an earthly journey than Abraham, and yet he's known for his faith. God does not expect us to be perfect. Rather, God expects us to do our dead level best to learn from our mistakes and bask in the warmth of God's forgiveness. A friend once told me, to live differently, you must do things differently. In this ongoing time of pause, let us all resolve to live differently by doing things differently. To let the past be the past. To claim God's mercies with each new day. And to live so that our lives reflect the faith of Abraham that keeps us coming back to our first love, the God of Abraham. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.